Hello, boxing fans, and welcome to the Neutral Corner episode 111. As I sit my tea here from my very, very handsome Montero unboxing mug, uh, I am Michael Montero, obviously, for Boxing Monthly Magazine and BoxingMonthly.com. We have a loaded show here, guys. Uh, this is going to be a two week show. TNC will be off next week. I'm doing some work-related travel stuff, so not going to be able to get in the studio to record the show. I will try to do some uh, some rant videos and stuff like that. So we're going to do two weeks of fight previews. The schedule is about to really, really get rolling. I want to say that like the next five or six weekends, we have some really, really good fights coming up. Not a whole lot to talk about last week, but a ton of stuff to preview. Uh, before we get into news and notes, wanted to... Um, Say really, really quickly, thank you to all of you who subscribe to the channel and, and believe in what we're doing and what we're doing for the right reasons. You know, we get flack sometimes from some people out there for my MOB mugs, uh, which, you know, this is just for me, or the Montero Unboxing t-shirts and stuff like that. There's people out there who don't quite get it. And they like to, you know, diss and this, that, the other. For those of you who support us, and for all of our Patreon people, thank you so, so much. For all of you who have bought a t-shirt or bought a couple of them and rock them at the gym when you go work out or blow up the brand to your friends, to your fight fan friends, really, really appreciate it. I really, really do, man, from the bottom of my heart. And uh, just for those of you who subscribe to the channel and now you're, you're uh telling your friends about it, you're telling your friends, your, your friends about the podcast on iTunes and all that stuff, thank you so damn much. I can't say it enough, and I don't say it often enough. So I just wanted to make sure I get that out before we even get started with the show. Another quick reminder, go to Apple Podcasts, go to Stitcher, go to SoundCloud, find Montero Unboxing, the Neutral Corner Podcast, leave a rating and a review, and more importantly, spread the word and get it out there to your fight fan friends. All right, guys, uh, that's enough with the preliminaries. Let's get into news and notes. So a couple of polls last week, uh, and actually these are still live. They're still going for a couple more days, but um, I asked here on one poll, uh, would you guys rather see Manny Pacquiao versus Vasily Lomachenko at 140 pounds later this year or Jorge Linares versus Lomachenko at 135 pounds? Uh, almost 500 of you have voted, and 42% of you say you want to see Linares and Lomachenko. Only 22% of you want to see Pacquiao and Lomachenko. And 16% of you, I did put this as an option, want to see both. If we can get both somehow, you'd like to see that. 20% of you said, please retire, Manny. So look, I'm going to take those results. And it's a tiny little poll in my tiny little profile. And I'm going to forward them to the brass at top rank. I'm going to uh, say, just screen capture the image. And I'm going to send that to them just to let them know what you guys are thinking. And again, it's a tiny little sample size because I have a tiny little footprint comparative to, to some other big wigs. But I think it's very, very clear. You guys are ready to see Manny walk away. Right? And I'm going to talk about Manny later on in this news and notes segment. I don't think he's walking away quite yet. We're going to be talking more about this in coming months. But uh, he, he's really there at the, at the cusp. Uh, well, he's been past that for years. It's just time to walk away, right, into the sunset. So uh, we'll talk more about this in a second. But I also did a, a poll, non-boxing related. I was just having a conversation with some friends. Settle an argument for me. Who had the more good to great songs over a longer period of time? Prince or David Bowie? Now, this was, uh, th this was a heated debate. And I put this up on my Facebook too. About one third of you said Prince and about two thirds of you said David Bowie. About 300 of you have voted. And what I find interesting is when I post questions like this, and I'm sorry, look, I won't spend long on this, okay? I know it's a boxing show. But... Um, if I say I prefer one guy over the other, that means I hate the other guy. And I just, I, I wanted to bring it up on this show because it's relevant to boxing because I get this all the time in boxing. If I criticize one person or say one fighter or one fighter's promotional outfit, or I prefer one fighter's style over another, that means I must hate the other guy. I, I just, people, people. We can be critical of one person and not like and not hate them. 
we can be complimentary of, of one person and still be critical of things that they do. It's not all one or the other. It's a mixed bag. Now for me, as it relates to David Bowie and Prince, I have a lot of friends. I live in Los Angeles, United States of America, obviously. Prince was from America, from Minnesota, right? American guy. A lot of people in America not only consider him great, but think he's the greatest of all time. A lot of American, especially pop music fans, because he was very much a pop top 40 uh, type of star, billboard top 40 kind of guy. And a lot of people think that he was the best of all time. And I think a lot of Americans, David Bowie and Prince died within, I think, a year of each other around the same time. And to me, they're very comparable because of their accomplishments. They're in the same stratosphere. But a lot of American music fans don't really recognize David Bowie as much. He's more recognized, I think, globally and more among maybe musical snobs, more among hipster elitist kind of uh, people who rate artistry more and experimenting in different genres. For my money, David Bowie had more good songs spanning. I mean, he did over 50 plus years and he dropped his last album, which was one of his best. I thought it was great. The Black Star album, literally two days before he died. And it had two really good songs on it. Black Star itself and Lazarus were two really good songs. So he just had a longer uh, run. And he was dying with cancer the last few years of his life when he put out two albums and a musical and some other projects. He, he did a big band project during that time. He did all kinds of stuff. And uh, if he didn't have cancer, he'd probably still be making music up until his 80s or 90s. So anyway, that's just how I see that one. But wanted to bring that example up because of some of the responses I saw. And just I just thought, you know, this, this relates to the boxing stuff because I get it all the time. Oh, you're a golden boy lover. Then three weeks later, oh, you're a golden boy hater. Oh, you're a PBC hater. Oh, you're a Deontay Wilder apologist. You know, you go back to the situation with Povetkin and all that. Guys, we're allowed to have nuance and we, we can go back and forth and we can have opinions and they could change and we can be on this side of the fence on one issue and then go back on that side of the fence on another issue we're allowed to do that we're human beings we're complex it doesn't all have to be all or nothing one-sided okay so anyway all right let's get to actual boxing news enough of the polls manny pacquiao i told you i was going to talk about him in this episode so it's not yet confirmed but it might be confirmed by the time i release this episode but it's very very close to being confirmed from what i hear manny pacquiao versus mike alvarado april 14th as the co-main on the jeff horn terrence crawford fight at madison square garden right now this is listed as just espn it isn't yet listed as espn pay-per-view at least uh, when you look at the um the listing agencies and so they don't have it as espn pay-per-view yet but it's likely it's rumored that if they add pacquiao to this card that's going to bump it to pay-per-view and that's going to be grandpa bob's justification for bumping it up to pay-per-view oh we got manny on there right so obviously mike alvarado would be a layup opponent for pacquiao even this completely shot version of pacquiao what's the point of this right some of you might be asking why would they even do this what's the point well it gets Pacquiao a good-looking knockout, likely knockout win over Alvarado, who actually has a few wins in a row after his rough stretch. He's fought tomato cans, but he does technically have some wins in a row here. It get Pacquiao a win and help Grandpa Bob set up a Pacquiao-Lomachenko fight down the road. That's exactly the point of this. That's exactly what they're trying to do. Also, it gets Terrence Crawford exposure on a Manny Pacquiao event. Face it, guys, Pacquiao is still a name. Look at the rating his fight did with Jeff Horn. I mean, that was some of the best ratings we have seen in decades on a non-pay-per-view broadcast. That wasn't on network TV. That was on cable, but not premium cable. One of the best uh, ratings in decades, right? So I don't hate this scenario. I don't hate the Pacquiao being in the co-main, even if it's against the Mike Alvarado of this Horn Crawford fight, so long as it doesn't go to pay-per-view. If it goes to pay-per-view, I freaking hate it. So we'll see what happens. It's likely to go pay-per-view, but I'm holding out hope that Grandpa Bob, uh, DeBuff, all the guys at top rank can work with the people at ESPN 
and get some sponsorship money and figure out a way to get this thing done on regular ESPN. And then it makes a lot of sense, actually. It really does make a lot of sense. Okay. Um, these two, Pacquiao and Elvarado, who are with Top Rank, and always have been as far as I know, um, or at least and not always, but have been for many, many years, right? They should have fought in 2013. Remember when Elvarado beat Brandon Rios, who we'll talk about later in this episode, in their rematch? They had a great first fight at uh, StubHub Center. I think back then it was Home Depot Center. I was there for that one. Great, great night of action. Great fight. Alvarado won that rematch. And I believe Pacquiao was coming off a loss. I don't know if it was the Bradley loss. Or actually, it might have been Bradley and uh, Marquez, right? So he needed a rebound. It would have made so much sense to put Pacquiao in there against Mike Alvarado at that time. But it didn't happen. So that fight is five years past its due date, if it happens. Pacquiao and Alvarado. Should have happened in 2013. Anyway, uh, we'll see what happens with this, okay? I'm trying to keep an open mind. I'm not saying I love the fight either way, but I get the business side of it, particularly if it goes to regular ESPN. So let's wait and see. Also, uh, fight update. Victor Postal was supposed to fight Reggie's Pro Gray. A really good looking prospect and a big step up fight for him. Postal injured his hand. He is out. They found a good replacement though. Julius Ndongo steps in to replace Postal. Now, is Julius Ndongo the quality of fighter Victor Postal is? No. I, I, I'm not quite sure Postal is mentally where he was before the Terrence Crawford loss. He just doesn't seem to have it anymore. I don't know if he's lost the thirst or whatever, but even a faded. 80% mentally there version of him is still much, much better than Julius Ndongo. So it's a slight buzzkill. But instead of just getting a last second replacement in there who is just anybody, Julius Ndongo is a guy who's been in there with some good quality fighters. He's coming off a loss. He's going to be hungry. Uh, I like this matchup for Pro Gray. I, I think that this will be uh, a pretty good one for him. And Ndongo is going to give him some things to think about. Not as crafty or as skilled as Postal, but does pose some problems. And I think it's going to be an interesting step-up fight for Pro Gray. Okay. I want to talk about this May 12th situation uh, with Vasil Lomachenko and the Canelo Golovkin replay. So Top Rank has said that the ESPN date that's open for them to bring Lomachenko back is May 12th, which obviously is seven days, a week after Canelo and Golovkin are going to fight in Las Vegas. HBO is going to do the, the replay, which they always do for the big pay-per-view fights, right? The following Saturday, which is May 12th. And Golden Boy Promotions is going to stick one, possibly two other fights attached to that. So they'll have a live card, which will likely be a doubleheader. And then they're going to show the uh, replay of Golovkin and Canelo. That's all happening on HBO, regular HBO, May 12th. But also on ESPN, you got this fight with Vasil Lomachenko. And ESPN is trying to keep these guys busy. They can't always get the matchups they want, but they want to get their fighters busy and fighting often on ESPN. Keep them busy. That's what this deal is. There's certain dates that are open that they've already agreed to, that they're signed, sealed, and delivered with ESPN. It's up to Grandpa Bob to fill the dates. And May 12th is the day that they are going to bring Lobachenko back at 135 pounds. This has already been agreed upon. Here's the issue. Lomachenko, Bob Arum, top rank, they want Jorge Linares on that day. Jorge Linares wants the fight. Down to do it. His team's in. Golden Boy Promotions, not crazy about it on that particular date. Because essentially what you'd have is... A card on ESPN, which is, it is a top rank card, but the, the signature fighter, one of them, is a Golden Boy fighter. And then you have this huge Golden Boy double, possibly triple header involving the Canelo Golovkin replay on HBO. So they don't want to go head to head with themselves, and they really don't want to go head to head with Aram either, but they'd rather go head to head and do their own thing on HBO and let top rank do their own thing on ESPN. In a perfect world, something could be worked out where the ESPN card would start early. Somehow they could do a, a, a fight between Lobachenko and Linares early, and that would feed over into the HBO card. 
that ain't happening, obviously, for a million reasons I could talk about, right? We know that's not happening. So likely what we're going to have, if I had to guess right now, is we're going to have Vasily Lomachenko against Raimundo Beltran for the WBO lightweight title May 12th. And that's going to go head to head with Golden Boy's Canelo Golovkin replay plus some live boxing that night. That's likely what we're going to get. And then likely we would get Lomachenko Linares late this year. I don't love it, but that's probably what we're going to get. More to come. We have to see how it all plays out. Okay. So I'm going to talk more about Raymundo Beltran in this episode in the preview section. Uh, and that's why I think that he's going to end up having that lightweight title. Um, anyway, that's it with news and notes. Let's talk real quick review of some of the action that took place last week. So Thursday, February 8th in Pensacola, Florida, Roy Jones Jr. scores a unanimous decision win in a cruiserweight bout. It was a 10-rounder. He is now 66-9, and 47 knockouts. He has been stopped himself five times. Uh, look, you don't have many fighters now, many pro fighters that have more than 60 pro fights, really more than 50. And for Jones, you know, now he's got over 70. Uh, normally, I would say this is a good thing. This is cool. But obviously, Roy is so far past it. And it has been for over a decade now. So uh, Roy says that this was his last fight. He has said that about 400 times and broken his word. We'll see. If it is his last fight, um, it, it'll be good. I'm happy. And he will be in the Hall of Fame five years from now. And it'll be interesting to be able to start really looking back at his career. I get asked about where I rate Jones and everything like that. And I can't right now because he's still fighting. Right, So once he's officially done for good, we can start having those discussions. Hopefully this was it for him. Now Saturday, February 10th, not a whole lot of big fights. Just some quick highlights here. Uh, Miguel Roman scored a fourth round knockout in uh, Ciudad Juarez, Mexico. Miguel Burchelt scored a third round TKO, uh, the second defense of his WBC Super Flyweight title in Cancun, Mexico. Hank Lundy scored a eight-round unanimous decision over 43-year-old Demarcus Corley in Philadelphia. Won pretty much every round of that fight, dropped him in the fourth round. It was the 80th pro bout of Demarcus Chop Chop Corley's pro career. So I talked just a second ago about Roy Jones having over 70 fights. This was pro bout number 80 for Corley, who I think now has like 20-something losses. Maybe even, it might, it might be 30 by now. Uh, at one point, this guy was, you know, a legit top contender because of his power. And he's given some uh, good fighters issues. And he's won some f good fights in his past. But boy, 80 pro fights, man. Time to hang him up. Also, undefeated American prospect. He uh, was a bronze medalist in the 2016 Olympics. Nico Hernandez improved to 4-0 improved to and o, uh, with three knockouts, scoring a five-round uh, TKO win in Park City, Kansas, not far from his hometown of Wichita, Kansas. Nico is becoming a little bit of a star there in, in Wichita, Kansas. Not a huge, huge star, but he's becoming a name there. He's getting a little buzz going. Um, back in last December, something I didn't know, this actual city of Wichita gave him and his family the building that they run their boxing club out of. I guess there's a building, an old building they started running their club out of, their gym. They sold it to them for a dollar so that they could continue to work with other, you know, Hernandez grew up poor in that community and they want them to continue to work with youth, poor, disenfranchised, working class youth in that area and bring them up in boxing. So the city sold them that building for a dollar. How cool is that? Also, uh, Wichita State University gave him a standing scholarship that he could use at any time. So if he wanted to retire tomorrow or take time off of boxing tomorrow and go to college, he has a standing scholarship at Wichita State. If he wants to fight his entire pro career and retire at 35, let's say, you know, over a decade from now, that scholarship still stands. So he will have a future after boxing if he wants it. How awesome is that? In this fight, Hernandez, as I mentioned, scored a TKO5 win. Uh, he had a last-second replacement. The fighter he was supposed to face got stuck 
I think with a, a delayed flight or a canceled flight or something at Chicago O'Hare Airport. So uh, last second replacement, he scores a win. I, I hear that there is like over 3,000 fans there, that that's kind of the average he's doing. You don't think of Wichita, Kansas as a huge boxing market. But if they can start to build something there, the way top rank did with Terrence Crawford in Omaha, that's that's something. You know, that's that's really, really something. So I, I want to keep an eye on that kid. All right, that's it with what took place last week. A lot of stuff to preview, guys. So let's get right into it. Friday, February 16th, we got some action out here in the L.A. area and in the West Coast. Uh, we have Thompson Boxing is putting on a card from the Doubletree Hotel in Ontario, California. They always do a live stream, and their live streams are great, great quality. I've worked with those guys before. They're great. Check out that card if you want something to uh, watch Friday. Bash Boxing is also doing a card from the Sportsman's Lodge in Studio City, California. That's a few miles north of downtown. Uh, I think they're going to do a live stream as well, so you guys can check all that out. But also, at the Grand Sierra Resort and Casino in Reno, Nevada, we got a couple of fights going on here. This is a top rank card. Raimundo Beltran is fighting... Uh, Paulus Moses, a Namibian fighter for the vacant WBO lightweight title. Now for Beltran, this will be his fourth attempt at not only just a lightweight title, but specifically the WBO lightweight title. Uh, Grandpa Bob has worked tirelessly to get him that damn title. And top rank, as I've mentioned many times, they are really in business with the WBO. They do a lot of business with the WBO. So Beltran is a fan and media favorite here in, in Southern California. Uh, a lot of the journalists around here and fans kind of fell in love with the guy, just being at the gyms, covering Manny Pacquiao, and he was one of Manny's chief sparring partners for a number of years. So a lot of the media people just got to know Ray Beltran, and they just liked the guy. He's a nice guy, he's a likable guy, but... This guy has a little bit of a checkered past, okay? okay? He, he's not a squeaky clean guy. There's some issues there. Two times he's been busted for performance enhancing drugs. He could have won the WBO lightweight title. It was all set up for him back in 2015 against the Japanese fighter, uh, Takahiro Ao. But he came in heavy, had trouble making weight. I don't know if he had issues in camp or what was going on or if he just used too many performance enhancing drugs and put on too much muscle i don't know apparently i think what he was using was trying to cut down the weight so maybe it was issues with camp i don't know either way he used performance enhancing drugs he was busted and he was out for a year and that was a fight he won big and he could have had that title back then but um he he fought terrence crawford i think after he came back and he lost big and there's no heart no shame in that at all it's terrence crawford right but he was outright robbed against Ricky Burns in his first attempt for that WBO lightweight title back in 2013. He broke Burns' jaw in the second round, but couldn't finish him. And you got to give Burns credit for lasting to, to the end of that fight. I mean, Burns, brass balls, son. I mean, that, that's hard, right? Um, but it made a lot of fans and media feel for Beltran and, and see him as a sympathetic figure. Also, there's his uh, immigration status here and what he's going through. And then this heightened political climate related to that issue i'm not even going to delve into it but there are people you know who, who feel for the guy but look he screwed up a couple of opportunities so you know he's really got when you when you compare him to some other fighters who didn't get a second third fourth opportunity um the dude's gotten plenty of opportunities this is his chance and this is set up for him this is a layup the guy is going up against Moses. He is rated by the WBO. He has the WBO Africa title. He is from Namibia, but he's he's rarely left that country. And um, he's made the order for Beltron stylistically. Uh, so he's good. This is another kind of setup fight. I hate to use that term, but that, that's kind of what this is to give Bob Arum and top rank more options. This opponent is going to make Beltron A, look good, B, get him a title, C, Give him, uh, it's, a pro, it's a promotable story and fight for Lomachenko down the line. So if Beltran gets out of this with no big injuries, no big bumps, bruises, cuts, nothing like that, and can fight again by May, and to deal with Lomachenko, Linares, if that can't be settled by then, if Golden Boy doesn't want to do it at that date, and I kind of understand why they wouldn't, then 
very, very good chance we could see Lomachenko and Beltran for this WBO lightweight title in May. And that's what I think we're going to see. Obviously, I like Beltran big in this fight. Uh, assuming everything's on the up and up and there's no issues. Also on this card, the mean machine, Igadigis Kavaliauskas, going up against David Avanesian in a 10-rounder. These are welterweights. Uh, for mean machine, he's 18-0 at 15 knockouts. Really started to get buzz among diehard fight fans a couple years ago and then kind of plateaued a little bit. So I don't know. I, I don't know. He's not quite as mean of a machine as he was being talked about as for, for a while there. Let's see if he can get some of that steam going again because it just seems like he's lost a little bit of momentum. Um, this is the best opponent of his young career, though. He only went pro in 2013. He hasn't even been a pro fighter for a full five years yet. So he's right about where he should be right now, fighting a guy like Avanesian, who was born in Russia but lives in the UK. And he went 12 rounds with Lamont Peterson last year. He went 12 rounds with an ancient Shane Mosley in 2016. Still, those 24 rounds, good experience. He's going to bring that into this fight against Kavaliauskas. If I'm butchering that name, I apologize. That's one of the tougher ones in boxing right now. Also on this card, and by the way, I like Mean Machine big by stoppage. He should get a stoppage in that fight. If there's really something to this guy that we need to watch, should get a stoppage, man. Should make a statement, right? Because this guy's already lost wide decisions to Peterson, to an ancient shade Mosley. I'd like to see the Mean Machine make a statement. Also on this card, Shakur Stevenson and Brian Jennings. So that's all the action for Friday. Going into Saturday, it's a big one. It's a big, big, big one. One that we're all excited for, right? World Boxing Super Series semifinals in the super middleweight division. George Groves, Chris Eubank Jr. This is the best matchup so far in the super middleweight tournament of, of the World Boxing Super Series. You know, at first I shaded toward Groves when this was first announced. But I've put more thought into this one. And, and let's be real here. Groves is only 29. I think there's only 18 months that separate these two in terms of age. But Groves is an old 29. There's a good part of that and a bad part of it. The good part is this guy has fought over 60 plus rounds with the likes of James DeGale, Glenn Johnson, Carl Frotch, Badu Jack, even guys like Martin Murray. He's been in there with some good experienced fighters. And that has created and developed a wealth of experience this guy has. However, He's been beat up a lot. And he was devastatingly KO'd by Carl Frotch in that rematch going back several years. And has seemed a little gun-shy at times since. Now, he had a reputation, Groves did, for tiring late in fights, his stamina issues. So part of the way he's tried to correct that is slowing down the pace with which he fights. So even if, let's say, chin-wise and everything, he could take Eubank's power, and I, I tend to think that he can, because I don't think Eubank is necessarily a hard puncher. He's just, he, he's a very fast, athletic puncher, but I don't know if there's a lot of beef behind those punches, right? But even if Groves can take the shots, I just don't think he's going to be active enough. Uh, for Eubank Jr., a lot of questions about this guy. He fought Billy Joe Saunders several years ago, lost, struggled with him, lost, close competitive fight, hasn't fought anybody since. And I know he did fight Arthur Abraham, I get it, but that was an ancient version of Arthur Abraham who had trouble making weight for that fight, had to weigh in several times, had almost nothing left, hasn't fought since. So, and, I, and again, you guys know this about me, I never thought that highly of Abraham at 168 pounds anyway. Um, just not... An elite level fighter, in my opinion. Top of, of the middleweight division, top of the super middleweight division for a while, but nobody I put on the elite stratosphere. So, anyway, Eubank has never faced a puncher. We don't know how he can catch, but Groves is not a big puncher. He's just not. And I know some of you will try to fight with me and say, yes, he is. Look at his record. What elite level fighter has he badly hurt or knocked out? He's not a puncher, and he doesn't punch enough. To set up the shots. He does have a nice jab. He does have good craft. I think he's the more skillful, craftful boxer of the two. But this fight is going to come down to activity. Graves fights, or Groves fights at a slower pace now. He tries to save himself for the later rounds. Eubank throws more punches. 
That's going to impress the judges. He's going to punch in flurries. And I think that he might lose a couple early rounds, but I actually think he's going to start to pull away in the middle rounds of this fight. I like him winning this fight by... I, I'm not wide on the cards, but decisively by two or three rounds. I, I do. I, some people are predicting a split decision, but it's possible. But I, I just see Eubank clearly winning this fight. Youth will be served, and he is going to move on to fight in the finals against Callum Smith. Yeah, I know Callum Smith hasn't fought his semifinal fight yet, but I think he's going to win. It's going to be an all UK showdown in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia, for the super middleweight finale of the World Boxing Super Series. I also don't think this fight is going to be quite as great as some people are predicting. I think that Groves Eubank will be exciting because of the fan atmosphere. I think that there will be jitters, there'll be tension, there's going to be bursts of action. But all in all, we're going to get 12 rounds with a lot of posturing and pawing with little offensive bursts. Eubank outworks Groves to win a decision. That's how I see it. Now, also, Saturday, a lot of action coming up. Uh, both sides of the pond. Over here in the United States, we have a couple of cards. At the Don Haskins Convention Center in El Paso, Texas, Devon Alexander is fighting Victor Ortiz. No, you did not just go in a time machine back to like 2012 or 2013. This is happening right now in 2018. This will also be aired on Fox. This is we have free TV. Uh, Alexander was out for 2016 most of 2017 he was dealing with some substance abuse issues i believe with painkillers um and maybe alcohol too but i think it was painkillers came back you know exercised those demons cleaned himself up good for him real good feel good story comes back last year uh november 21st and scores a unanimous decision 10 round uh, it was a 10 round fight unanimous decision win had lost three of his last four before that but admittedly he said he was struggling with substance abuse during that time so who knows you know who knows uh, what may have happened in those fights had he not been struggling with those issues for victor ortiz who remember go back to 2011 he's ko'd by floyd mayweather 2011 right with the the sucker punch heard around the world he has gone three and three since then only one bout in 2016 only one bout in 2017 so from 2011 to now in 2018, Victor Ortiz has gone three and three. That tells you how often or not often he's fought, right? And both these guys have been inactive, but for different reasons. Alexander is five foot eight, 69 inch reach. He's a southpaw, 31 years old. You look at Ortiz, very, very similar numbers, man. Five foot nine, 70 inch reach. So he is naturally a little bigger. He's also a southpaw. He's also 31 years old. But I think. He's beat up his body a little bit more. As crazy as that sounds, because I talked about the the you know issues with substance abuse for Devin Alexander. I think in the ring and just lifestyle, partying, all that kind of stuff. I, I just just seeing the guy in person, I think Ortiz is actually older in fighter years. That's what I see. He's also been stopped, man. He's been hurt. He's been stopped. He's been beat up more. So I think Alexander is the fresher guy. 27-4 with 14 knockouts. It just doesn't have as many fights as Ortiz, who is 32-6, two draws, 25 knockouts. The due date for this fight was 2011-2012. You're getting it in 2018. Hey, it's free. It's on Fox. I think it'll be fun. I like Alexander. Just more levels and just, quite frankly, just a better fighter. Top to bottom, just a better fighter. Ortiz has more power. He's a bigger, naturally stronger guy, has more power. But Alexander has always shown a good chin. And I think that... He's going to win pretty wide in this fight. Also, Comain, Caleb Plant, undefeated prospect, I believe out of Tennessee. Another one of these guys from the middle of the country trying to build himself up. Interesting where the different fighters are coming from now in the United States. They're not coming from the old guard, you know, New York, Philly, Detroit. You're not getting those fighters out of there as much anymore. You're getting these guys from the Midwest, the South, and of course out here. So Plant is 16-0 with 10 knockouts, super middleweight prospect. Went pro in 2014, having his first big step up in opposition, going up against Rogelio Medina. And this is really the first test of his career. We're going to find out if Caleb Plant has any substance to him. Because so far it's looked, eh. you kind of watch him fight and you go, eh. you see some athleticism, some skills, but there's just no killer instinct. There's just no substance there. 
Now, Rogelio Porky Medina is from Mexico. He's been in with several good fighters. Uh, Gilberto Ramirez, Jose Uzcategui, Badu Jack, James DeGale, David Benavidez. And that David Benavidez fight, that's the important one to remember. David Benavidez, super middleweight prospect, who's huge for that division, right? We all know he's going to be a light heavyweight very soon. But he destroyed Medina. And badly knocked him out. Now, Styles make fights, and Caleb Plant just doesn't fight like Benavidez. But if there is anything to Plant, who is six foot one, 74 inch reach, only 25 years old, started boxing at the age of 12, 2011 Golden Gloves champ, he should not only win this fight, but he should win big and he should get a stoppage. If he doesn't, Caleb Plant is more suspect than prospect, in my opinion. Okay. Mandalay Bay Hotel and Casino, Las Vegas. This is the, the PBC, uh, the Fox card I just talked about is PBC and Fox. Then it's going to switch to this Showtime card for the Mandalay Bay in uh, Las Vegas. Danny Garcia making his return after the loss last year to Keith Thurman. That was back in March. Been out of the ring almost a full year. Going up against Brandon Bam Bam Rios. Whew. Who looked really rejuvenated against Aaron Herrera last June, but who doesn't look rejuvenated against Aaron Herrera, right? So Garcia is 29 years old, 5'8", 68 inch reach, former junior welterweight champ. He really was the legitimate champion at 140 pounds. He was a titleist at welterweight. And coming off that loss to Keith Thurman, which I think was like a split decision, which is crazy. Keith Thurman clearly won that fight clearly beat Danny Garcia in my opinion uh, Bam Bam Rios 31 years old and it's an old 31 you want to talk about lifestyle both in and out of the ring he's a very old 31 he's the oldest 31 year old in boxing right now 5 foot 8 68 inch reach so he's the same size as Danny Swift but he is a former lightweight titleist his first his only title he's ever had was that lightweight um when you just look at the styles of these two fighters and where they're at in their career, and I know that Garcia isn't very active, so he doesn't look sharp early in fights. That's why this matchup is perfect matchmaking for PBC if you're trying to get action because Rios is going to make it exciting early on in brawl. But eventually Swift is going to get in his groove and he's going to start to land left hook, or left hook counters. He's going to land one twos. He's going to land with the jab. But I really think it's going to be a left hook counter on the inside in the middle rounds that badly jacks up Brandon Rios. I actually like Danny Garcia by stoppage in this fight. If he can't stop this version of Brandon Rios, it's uh, Garcia's finished as, as an elite level welterweight. He should stop Rios in this fight, and I think he will. Also on this card, the rematch between David Benavidez and Ronald Gavril. This is the first defense of the WBC super middleweight title uh, that was a vacant title in their first fight that Benavidez barely won, right? He won by split decision. He was dropped late in that fight. Benavidez is really just a prospect with a title. He's 19-0 and with 17 knockouts. Most of the time, a guy with a limited amateur career who has that few pro fights, we call him a prospect in boxing, right? It's one thing if you had 300, 400, 500 amateur fights, but David Benavidez, I think he had like a couple dozen amateur fights. So he's really raw, really a prospect. In that first fight, these scorecards, Glenn Trowbridge had Gavriel winning 116-111. Remember, there was a knockdown, so that's eight rounds to four for Gavril. Adelaide Bird and Dave Moretti both had Benavidez up real big. Bird had him 116-111, which off the top of my head, what is that, nine rounds to three? And Dave Moretti had 117-111, which is 10 rounds to two. So those scorecards were all over the freaking place. I thought it was a close fight, but I thought Benavidez won. I thought those two scores were a little too wide for him. I thought Trowbridge's score for Gavriel was too wide for him. So just weird scorecards all around that day. But, you know, it's freaking Nevada, right? So in this fight, I think Benavidez is going to take the 12 rounds. Remember, this guy had a very limited amateur career. That first fight with Gavriel was a real test for him. It had no business being a title fight. And I still don't look at uh, Benavidez as a champion. He has a title. He's a titleist. He's a prospect with a title. 
but he's going to take those 12 rounds and learn from them and apply what he learned. This is going to, going to be real learning on the job. I like him to not only win uh, convincingly, decisively, but he's going to get a knockout. He's going to score a knockout win in this fight. That's what I expect from him. And if he does, Benavides is really something to look at because Gavrila is no slouch. If we could see that type of improvement from one fight to the next, from a prospect, because that's what Benavidez is, this dude's for real. Okay, let's skip to next, next week. Thursday, February 22nd. It is a Golden Boy on ESPN card. I think specifically on ESPN2, and they'll be streaming it on ESPN3. Uh, This is from Fantasy Springs Casino in Indio, California. Joseph Diaz Jr., Going up against Victor Terrazas. This is a 10-round fight. Diaz is 25-0 with 13 knockouts from Downey, California. That's a few miles south of Los Angeles. It's in the LA metro area. He won a WBC mandatory eliminator fight last September. This is kind of a stay-busy fight for him because the guy that he's going to fight for the title is Gary Russell Jr. That's the WBC titleist there at Featherweight. And for some reason... You know, he's just sitting on ice. That's just what they do over there. So uh, Golden Boy and Team Diaz doing the smart thing and getting Joseph Diaz uh, some some action in the ring to keep him fresh. Later on in the year, maybe in the summer, he's going to fight uh, Russell for that WBC featherweight title. Also a couple of undefeated, several undefeated prospects on this card, but a couple I'll talk about real quick. Uh, Virgil Ortiz is 8-0 with 8 knockouts. He's from Texas. Uh, he's fighting in an eight-rounder against Jesus Alvarez Rodriguez. Edgar Valerio, 12-0 with seven knockouts from here in Los Angeles. Uh, he's fighting in an eight-rounder. These are featherweights going up against Jose Antonio Martinez. So that should be a fun card with some young fighters to keep an eye on. Saturday, February 24th. A lot going on. Whew. Nuremberg, Germany. Callum Smith going up against Jurgen Brommer. World Boxing Super Series semifinals for the super middleweights. Smith is one of four boxing Smith brothers. Uh, You got Paul Smith, Stephen Smith, and Liam Smith, and then Callum Smith. Most people say Callum is the best of all of them. He's just the best overall package of the Smith boxing brothers. He's 23 and over 17 knockouts, six foot three. Six foot three and gets down to this weight. He's a big guy for that division, just like Benavidez is. 27 years old. He beat uh, Eric Scoglin in the, in the opening round, which was, you know, really a layup. Um, the opening round of, of that super middleweight tournament, not very good, right? So he's making a big leap in opposition because Brahmer, the German, even though he's 39 years old and he's a lot smaller, he's only 5'11 compared to Smith 6'3, he is a southpaw and he is experienced and crafty. You know, he beat Rob Brandt, the only American in the entire WBSS in the opening round. Uh, but a lot of guys, you know, they forget. brahmer has been in with some good fighters, and he's got some craftiness and some skill and experience. He had legal troubles in the late 90s and early 2000s that, that halted his professional career for a while. And it's a shame because it would have been interesting to see what this guy could have accomplished years ago. But um, I don't think he ever would have been an elite level professional prize fighter but he would have won titles particularly with the germans and how they were passing around middleweight and super middleweight titles all those years with like the felix sturms and the arthur abrahams those guys right people forget brummer was a decorated amateur he won gold in the 1996 world junior championships in cuba as an amateur he beat ricky hatton i want to say twice and i want to say he stopped him he beat felix sturm in the amateurs he beat carl frotch in the amateurs so this guy you know Good, solid, professional, knowledgeable, skilled prize fighter. But Callum Smith, much like the Groves Eubank Jr. matchup, I just think youth is going to have its way. And we're going to wind up with a Eubank Smith finale that's going to be a lot of fun. So I, I like Smith by decision in this fight and pretty wide decision. Uh, you know, three or four rounds. When I say wide, it went by three or four points. Also, in York Hall, London, a Frank Warren card with some prospects, uh, some of Warren's prospects that he's keeping busy. Anthony Yard, who's a 14-0 light heavyweight. Zelfa Barrett, who is a 19-0 super featherweight. And Daniel Dubois, 6-0 heavyweight. All scheduled in 10 rounders. I like that these prospects are stepping up to 10 rounders already. That's the way to do it, man. 
Frank Warren is kind of, kind of the Bob Arum of the UK, the way he does things. And he's still building some good prospects over there. Obviously, the big, big event, though, February 24th, is here in Los Angeles. Inglewood, to be exact, at the Forum. It's Superfly 2. And on this card, and I'm not even talking about the undercard. I'm talking about the four fights, uh, the four major fights on the card. You have fighters representing the USA, Ukraine, Philippines, Argentina, Mexico, Puerto Rico, and Thailand. Think about that for a second. This is like the most international card ever. I love it. I love it. So Brian Valoria is fighting Artem Delakian for a vacant flyweight title, the vacant WBA flyweight title. Valoria went pro in 2001. Dude has been a pro for going on 20 years now. People people forget about that. He's been around for a long time. And he was a good amateur as well for, for the USA. Uh, one title is at 108 and 112 pounds. He unified titles at flyweight, the WBA and WBO, back in 2012. And then he lost in his very next fight, which was in 2013, by split decision to Juan Francisco Estrada. As I talk about the fighters on this card, you're going to see the round robin kind of tournament that's been happening between these guys for years and why this these super flag cards make so much sense. Um, he lost TKO 9 to Roman Gonzalez in 2015. Roman Gonzalez obviously had a rough one in the first Superfly card last year, right? So Valoria has been around forever, experienced. Uh, he's won titles. And this Dalakian kid, born in Azerbaijan, now based out of the Ukraine. In fact, this is his first fight outside of the Ukraine, taking a quantum leap in opposition. He's fought absolutely nobody. So, um, and I couldn't even find much information about this guy as an amateur. So I, I just don't know. Um, I don't know how he is fighting in a title fight. He's done nothing to earn it. Valoria certainly has. I have no problem with him fighting for a vacant title. But this kid from the Ukraine, I don't know. We're going to see if he has any substance to him. I really don't know anything about him. Also, Donnie Nietes fighting Juan Carlos uh, Revico for the IBF flyweight title that Nietes won last year. Nietes is a Filipino fighter, started his career at 105 pounds, won titles there, also won titles at 108, and obviously 112 pounds. So he's won titles in three different divisions. This is the first defense of the vacant flyweight belt that he won. Uh, it was that last April, actually. Revico is an, from Argentina, Argentinian fighter, former titleist at 108 and 112 pounds, all three of his losses were in bouts outside of Argentina. And guess what? He's going to get his fourth fight or his fourth loss outside of Argentina in this fight. I like Nietes by decision. That fight is definitely going the distance. Carlos Quadras versus McWilliams Arroyo for the vacant WBC silver 115 pound title. Whatever the hell silver means. And obviously the silver title is just the way for the WBC to sanction a fight, which is essentially an eliminator. It's a mandatory eliminator. So the winner of this fight will fight the winner of the main event. Uh, Carlos Quadras, who is on the Superfly 1 card, uh, go back, go back a couple years, lost a close competitive unanimous decision to Roman Chaco Tito Gonzalez in 2016. Had a lackluster comeback fight with David Carmona, last March. Got the W, but it was a lackluster performance. And he got a lot of criticism about that. And he heard it. And he applied it. And he fought very, very well in a close, uh, competitive, it wasn't that close, but a competitive loss to Juan Francisco Estrada on that Superfly card last September 9th. So uh, he's kind of run the gamut. He's fought the best of the division. And we've seen what he has to offer. Can he put it together against McWilliams Arroyo, who I believe is a very underappreciated fighter. He and his brother, his twin brother, McJoe Arroyo, are only the second pair of twins. Here, here's a little factoid for you. The second pair of twins to qualify for the Olympics in boxing. So there's a little stat. This guy represented Puerto Rico in the Olympics. Very, very decorated amateur career. I believe he won the world championships at one point. As a pro, he was robbed against the Thai fighter Amnat Ruenruang in Thailand in 2014. He deserved to win that fight, and he should have had a title. You might remember the name Ruenruang because he's the guy who beat Zhou Ximing and kind of burst that hype bubble. 
But I felt that Arroyo beat him and should have had a title. He should be a former titleist at Flyweight. He had a wide loss to Chocolatito back in 2016. Hasn't fought since. So he's been out of the ring for well over a year, going on two years. Is that time off going to help him or not? Um, I'm of the belief that fighters who fight more often stay sharper. This is a Mexico versus Puerto Rico matchup, which is going to make it a lot of fun for the crowd. But uh, I like Quadras in this fight by decision. Main event, We Sok Sil Wangek or Sri Saketsuwa Rungvisai whichever you prefer. Going up against Juan Francisco Estrada, uh, Juan Gek defending his WBC super flyweight title. This is a fantastic matchup. Last year, Juan Gek slash Rungvisai really, really hit the scene with his two wins over Gonzalez. Uh, I was there for both of them ringside. I still think that he probably lost that first fight to Gonzalez, but he left no doubt in the rematch and showed Fast improvement. And it wasn't just with the way he punched and the way he fought. It was with the way he thought, his confidence. Just being around that Superfly promotion last year and seeing the way Rung Visai looked in the media workouts in the, in the, uh, at the weigh-in, at the press events, he looked ready. He wanted it. He knew that was his moment in that rematch with Chocolatito. And boy, did he take advantage of that opportunity. And now here he is in this main event. For Estrada, who started as, uh, I can't remember if he started, he might have started at 108 pounds, but I know the bulk of his work obviously was at flyweight. Close competitive loss to Chocolatito. In Chocolatito's prime going back a few years really gave him a tough fight. Um, Really been one of those guys, in my opinion, that's been on the bubble of that pound for pound list. Not quite top 10, maybe right around there, right? But on the bubble. Uh, had some injury issues, you know, had, was out of the ring for a little while there, but came back and won a good, competitive, uh, entertaining fight against Quadras on that Superfly One card last September. Now he's up against a completely different animal. And this fight's fascinating to me. I keep going back and forth. When you talk about craft, experience, fighting on the outside, fighting on the inside, extending, getting full extension on the punches, not necessarily with power, but with precision to keep your opponent off you and move your opponent and turn them. Estrada is, is just a great, fantastic technician. Really, really fabulous fighter. For Rungvisai, he seems to be a guy that's improving and peaking because mentally his confidence has caught up to his physicality. He's a big, strong guy for that division. Uh, not quite as big as like a Naoya and Oyue or you know, even, even a Jerwin and Cajas, but he's a big physical guy and he fights that way. And the rounds he went with Chocolatito, especially the first 12 rounds that he went back last March, I think just did wonders for this guy. It made him so much better. I gotta favor him in this fight, man. I just have to. On paper, you want to you want to take Estrada. He's just so much more experienced, and he's much closer to his prime than Gonzalez was. Who, who Chocolatito's best weight? He didn't carry the weight well at 115 pounds, and he had been in some rough fights and was softened up by the time he got to to Rungvisai. And I think Estrada's way fresher, but. Ron is just so big and strong, and I just think he makes his punches count. And I think we're going to get a seesaw back and forth battle. We're, this is going to be a very close competitive fight. I like Ron to walk out of this thing with a close decision win. That's what I see happening. Wouldn't be surprised if we saw a controversial type of score where we get a split decision, whether it's Estrada or Wangek that gets it that has fans and media split. But I just happen to think that we're seeing something in this fighter with Rung Visai where he's peaking. He's really peaking. And I think he's going to get the W here. Either way, the winner of this fight is going to fight the winner between Quadras and Arroyo. And you can't do wrong with that matchup. I, I do think Carlos Quadras is going to win. So seeing Rung Visai fight Quadras next or seeing him fight or seeing Estrada fight Quadras next... Those are fabulous fights. And I think that we're going to get a Superfly 3 card either late this year or early next year. 
These are going to be cards we see a lot of. And there's so many fights based on the winners of the four fights I mentioned that could fight each other. We could just see this recycling act and it's all going to be good. And it doesn't matter that some of these guys lose. It's losing in exciting fashion and wanting to see them again. So I love this card. It's going to be a sellout there. Uh, I think they blocked off at the forum the upper level of the forum, but from the mid lower level, all that is on sale. Less than a thousand tickets were available last week. It's going to be a sellout. I will be there tailgating. I will be hanging out at the tailgates in the parking lot. So I will see you guys there. I'm going to make sure I get there to that one early. I'm going to go get my workout in early Saturday morning to see you guys there. So come say hi uh, when you see me at that card, guys. But for now, that's it, guys. Loaded episode, two weeks of previews. I hope you guys enjoy it. Let me know what you think. Like, comment, share, subscribe. Go give us a rating and a review on iTunes and Stitcher and SoundCloud. I'll see you at the fights.